Here is our list of panelists. Um, we're going to kick it off with Howard Ratner, who is the executive director of Chorus. Uh, then we'll hear from Caroline Burley, who is the journals manager for publishing services and production um, of the Royal so Society of Chemistry. We'll then hear from Sarah Lippincott, who's head of community engagement at Dryad. Then from Patricia Feeney, Feeney, who is head of metadata at Crossref. And finally, from Kristen Rattan, who's the founder of Stratos, who has done a great deal of work uh, with aligning science across Parkinson's on funding metadata. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Howard, first of all. Howard, feel free to share your screen and tell us what you got to tell us. That all look good? Great. Yep, looks great. All right, so um, thanks to Amanda and to Roar for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, during this annual meeting and celebration. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been working in scholarly publishing for over 35 years. And during the last 20, I've been involved with persistent identifiers and infrastructure. I've led the initial technical foundations of the DOI and Crossref systems, co-founded ORCID, was on the first clocks board and was part of the founding Roar community. Pulling all this together led me to Chorus. So what is Chorus? We're a not-for-profit community effort trying to reduce the burden of complying with open and public access mandates. We're creating a future where the output flowing from funded research is easily and permanently discoverable, accessible, and verifiable by anyone in the world. We are comprised of an ever-growing number of institutions, learned societies, society publishers, as well as commercial publishers. We like to say that we make up more than 75% of the world's published output from funded research. Our partner agencies listed here, NSF, DOE, DOD, NASA, USDA, JST, CSIRO, and others, are invaluable allies in helping us to move forward. We are dedicated to making open research work and doing so since our inception in 2013. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance, and we're working to develop metrics about open data, we help our stakeholders improve the quality of their metadata related to open research, and we've been hosting forums and workshops very much like today's webinar to connect the stakeholders so that they can learn from each other and hopefully build trust. So how does Chorus work? And this is where you can see what, why funder metadata is really important. Um, I am very much a persistent identifier or PID junkie. It probably won't be a surprise to anyone to see that these PIDs, especially funder IDs, are central to what we do at Chorus. Publishers at the 12 o'clock spot collect and send content DOIs and funder IDs to Crossref and more recently to the Japan Link Center. Once that happens, we can consume this information so we can check whether or not an article is archived for preservation at Clocks and or Portico, whether or not a preprint has been deposited in a repository, whether or not the article is appearing on an agency portal, whether there is public grant information, whether or not authors have ORCID ID records, and whether there are relevant data sets to link to via the Scholex framework, which uses persistent identifiers found in data site and other sources. For example, using our dashboards, reports, and APIs, publishers, institutions, and funders can enhance their open science compliance tracking and improve their, their metadata. So here's an example of the NASA NASA dashboard, digging deeper down, showing how we connect up funder metadata to ROARS, and another important metadata for all of the CORA stakeholders. Our agency partners use CORA services in a variety of ways. They securely harvest full text for indexing from publishers. They present metadata on agency portals. They link to full text on publishers' sites via their, the DOI. They engage with publisher members on compliance issues. They use regular email alerts for compliance tracking. They use our dashboards for also for compliance tracking. And finally, they ingest bibliographic and compliance metadata via our open APIs. So all the speakers were asked, if you had a magic wand, what would be the one thing you'd do to improve funding metadata? So I gave that some thought. And my magic wish would be, could we make extracting PIDs and their associated metadata from articles, data sets, and software simple, open, and affordable for everyone? This would enable an enormous amount of open, transparent discovery and reporting that would benefit all in the scholarly ecosystem. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Howard. Um, I love the magic wand question. Thanks for responding to that. All right, next we'll hear from Caroline. Caroline? Thank you. Oh, hang on. It's not. Um, 
Let me share the right screen. Can you all see my screen okay? Mm, yes. Excellent, right. So hi everyone, I am Caroline Burley and I'm Journals Manager for Publishing Services and Production at the Royal Society of Chemistry. The RSC is a scientific body based in the UK. We're one of the leading organisations dedicated to advancing the chemical sciences. Founded in 1841, we play a key role in promoting excellence in the chemical sciences through various activities, including as a membership organisation, supporting education, advocating for the interests of our community at the government level, organising public engagement and academic events, and we're a successful international publisher, publishing a range of books, journals and databases. As a not-for-profit organisation, our revenues are invested back into our community through our charitable activities. As a publisher, our journals, uh, well, we publish over 50 peer-reviewed scientific journals, being known for rigorous and fair peer review, fast publication times and quality content. And our journals are a mix of traditional subscription journals and open access journals. As part of our strategy, which I've shown here, we're aiming to transition all of our fully owned journals to open access by 2028. So why is funding metadata important to us at the RSC? Well, it helps us to achieve our purpose as outlined in our charter to disseminate chemical knowledge. Including fund and metadata is a part of good publishing practices. It contributes to the overall integrity and ethical conduct of research by ensuring transparency about the financial support received and disclosing funding sources helps prevent conflicts of interest. By providing clear and accurate funding information in papers, we're promoting trust and accountability. Funding agencies will often require researchers to acknowledge their support in published work. So by including accurate funding metadata, that means that we can help our authors to comply with those policies and also facilitates funders and other stakeholders to more easily identify and report on the published outputs associated with that funding. Accurate funding metadata ensures that the contributions of funders are properly attributed. This not only acknowledges their support, but also recognises the role of funding agencies in advancing research and knowledge. Good funding metadata supports data integration and interoperability within the scholarly ecosystem. It can enable exchange of information between publishers and other stakeholders, contributing to a more connected and efficient scholarly landscape from which everyone can benefit. Metadata can be used to help automate publisher workflows. So for example, we could use metadata to identify mandates that our authors need to comply with and proactively steer our authors towards compliance. For example, helping them with their specific OA license requirements or by automatically depositing information in required repositories on their behalf. I mentioned our aim to transition our journals to full open access and in the context of OA publishing we view metadata as key to ensuring the discoverability, interoperability and accessibility of our OA content. And last but not least, good metadata gives us insights into who our stakeholders and customers are, allowing us to better understand and meet their needs. So this is what we're doing with funder information at the moment. We collect it in our submission system as a field in the submission form that authors have to complete, but it's not mandatory because not every submission has funder metadata, funder information associated with it. And even if they did, how many funders could we um, technically mandate? One, two, more, number of funders and a paper varies. So we find that our authors often will just provide us with the information for one funder in the submission form, even though they may acknowledge more funders in their paper. So on that form, the author enters free text and an autocomplete attempts to match it. And if it does, then that funder ID is added to the article's metadata and that carries through with it to the acceptance point where we export that metadata and use it in our OA and license system to prompt authors to choose the OA and license options that are mandated by our common funders. 
The metadata is also exported to our production systems and we include it in our article XML and validate against the acknowledgement sections to complete that funder data. Because as I said, we find that authors don't give us the complete metadata. So we're tagging them and adding further funder information and IDs to the papers. We show the funder metadata along with other article metadata to authors at the proof stage and ask them to check it and complete it. And we pass on any feedback to Crossref if we think that we've identified a funder who isn't in the registry because they're missing or we just can't make a confident match. Then when we publish the article, we send the um, information to Crossref, which then allows, for example, Chorus to take the funder and license metadata to provide information to Chorus funder participants. For green chorus articles, we add specific tags that allow chorus funders to data mine the article XML during the 12 month embargo. And we automatically recognize chorus articles and, and ensure that the PDF author version is queued up and made freely available after the 12 month embargo. And finally, we deposit articles on behalf of our authors, for example, with PMC, the funder mandates it and send a publication notification to OA switchboard so that the participating institutes and funders can be alerted. So to answer this question that we were asked, I asked my colleagues what their answer would be, and this is what they suggested. I think most of us probably agree that this is a great vision to have, but the may be quite some way off from being able to achieve it and we all have our own challenges to address before we can get there so I'm cheating somewhat coming up with a, a second wish because thinking more practically about what would help us now our main challenge as a publisher really is in extracting complete and good quality metadata because our authors really are giving us textual information but aren't so good at giving us metadata. So we're having to validate that information. And we do that in our production processes because the technologies are better at that point. But really having metadata available to us upstream at submission would unlock much more potential for us and enable us to help our authors much more. So having tools that would help us to do that is probably the most impactful thing that would help us right now and specifically tools that we can easily integrate into our existing platforms and workflows. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. I especially like um, the philosophy that providing good metadata is an essential part of publishing. Uh, could not agree more. Okay. Um, our next presenter is Sarah. Sarah, you can go ahead and share your screen if you're ready. Great. Um... Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm Sarah Lippincott. I'm the head of community engagement at Dryad. Dryad is an open international data publishing platform and community committed to the open availability and routine reuse of all research data. And we do what we do because we envision a future where the open availability of reusable data accelerates scientific discovery across domains and leads to concrete benefits for society. We were founded in 2007 by researchers with a commitment to research integrity and the public good. One of our founders, Todd Vision, um, said, said, for example, that data are a classic example of a public good uh, in that they can be reused infinitely and in creative ways without diminishing in value um, and can be repurposed in, in myriad ways uh, that the original creators may not have envisioned. So since our founding, we have curated and published over 60,000 data sets across domains, representing the work of nearly 200,000 researchers at nearly 70,000 institutions around the world. And our data sets are connected to research articles in over 1,200 academic journals. Because of our commitment and our focus at Dryad on data reuse, not just data archiving or, or data storage, but on reuse is ensuring metadata and data quality of everything that we publish. We do this in a number of ways, but primarily we do it through curation and connections. Every data set that we publish undergoes a hands-on 
curation or quality control process that evaluates metadata and data files to ensure that they're suitable for sharing, that metadata is sufficient to support discovery and reuse, and that data files can be opened and interpreted. In terms of making connections and ensuring that data is part of the network of scholarly knowledge that's available for reuse and is connected to the other scholarly outputs that provide necessary context for its reuse, we rely heavily on persistent identifiers um, in, uh, in our architecture. <clears throat> we were one of the earliest adopters of the research organization registry uh, for uh, researcher affiliations. We've had ROR IDs uh, uh, connected to uh, Dryad data sets since 2019. Um, and uh, thanks to, to Ted Haberman, we were we even retroactively added research organization registry IDs to existing Dryad metadata. So it didn't uh, just apply going forward, but um, ac we actually went back and enriched records that were already in Dryad to add those ROR IDs for metadata completeness. And we've recently transitioned to ROR for funder metadata as well. We make this uh, metadata, so the, you know, this is what the user sees on the front end, just a, a, you know, a, a regular text string, um, but we also make this information available in a machine readable format through our API. So you can see that that affiliation um, is, is included both as a text string and as uh, the, the ROR ID, um, and the same for that funder metadata. Um, so making this information available through our API and through, uh, you know, having it as part of the metadata record of every data set makes it possible for us to provide robust con context, build programmatic connections between a data set and its creators, funders, and related outputs, and allow others to harvest and work with that data as well. From Dryad's perspective, funding metadata is is critical to enriching our metadata records to ensuring that we are connecting uh, the, uh, the Dryad data to its creators, its related outputs, its its sponsors, all of the the actors and related outputs that are um, that are necessary to contextualize it. Um, we want uh, funders to be able to track their their impact in, in the world. And we make available of a dashboard for funders that they can see uh, that's connected to those, uh, those IDs uh, so that they can track the research data sets that they've funded that have become part of the triad corpus. We believe in, as I said, research integrity and transparency are at the heart of what we do at Dryad. We make data available to be validated and, and replicated and repurposed. Um, and funding transparency is, is part of research of that research integr integrity and transparency, making sure that future users are aware of uh, the, the funders that have contributed to producing a data set. Um, and finally, um, we uh, this information can provide insights about the the health and investments at the ecosystem level. We make this information available publicly through our API for uh, for bibliometric research, scientometric research for for the the kind of meta analysis of, of the at the network level. Um, so. Um, if, if I had a magic wand, um, as I as I end here, what, what would we do at Dryad to improve funding metadata or what would we like to see in the world? We would love for all funders to, to have their own APIs so that we can validate things like award numbers and get additional metadata about awards to, to harvest and to, to make to enrich our own metadata records and complement the metadata that we collect. Um, and uh, and I, I would also echo um, all everything that others have said so far about um, being able to more accurately harvest that information or get that information uh, either directly from authors or to extract it from the uh, from their submissions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, wow, if all funders had their own APIs, um, that's quite a um, Amazing vision. That would be fantastic. All right, Patricia Feeney, turning oh, it over to you. Oh, so, um, it's 
very cold here and I'm having trouble getting my fingers to move my boxes around on my screen. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, I am Patricia Vini. I'm the head of metadata, metadata at Crossref. Um, we're a uh, not-for-profit membership organization that makes research op outputs easy to find, site link, ass assess, and reuse. Funding metadata is a very important part of that. Um, we have over 20,000 members around the world. Um, they encompass traditional and non-traditional scholarly publishers, research organizations, funders, of course, and our metadata is all open and available to use without a license. Um, so our goal as an organization is to create a rich and reusable open network of relationships, connecting research organizations, people's things and actions. Um, we like to say it's a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. Um, so this is a network based on metadata. Um, the, the research nexus, it goes beyond just having persistent identifiers for journal articles. It's uh, It encompasses things like book chapters, grants, preprint data, software statements, dissertations, um, all, all anything with any kind of funding metadata. And the goal is to make this all interconnected and uh, machine readable and, and easy to interrogate. And there's a real emphasis on, in the future, we'd like to really emphasis, put an emphasis more on the relationships between these different objects and out, outputs and ideas. And, um, so you, so it's not just about objects, it's more about how they all relate to each other. <laughs> so we do collect a lot of funding metadata. Um, we collect, um, this funding metadata, metadata for various uses from our membership. Um, this can, the goal is to help organizations like universities, funders, and governments to track and demonstrate the outcomes of their investments. Um, this funding metadata can help provide benchmarking in, information. It can help um, show compliance with vendor mandates. I know that's that's something that's become uh, very important in recent years. Um, it can help organizations decide what what other research to fund just to generally assess the impact of funding. Um, this information can all be um, included in cross um, cross ref metadata. We've got these grant records. As I mentioned, we register uh, metadata for grants. Um, they that collect connects comprehensive funding information, including funder amounts and funder and the types of funding to research. Um, just to go into a little more detail, um, we've got eight, eight and a half million cross-ref records that contain funder registry ID identifiers. Um, there are over 34,000 funder registry identifiers, but I'm sure many of you have seen the announcement that we're are going to be folding, we are in the process very far along in the process of folding our funder registry into the ROAR registry. Um, and we are going to imminently, very soon, be able to accept ROAR identifiers um, instead of an addition, in addition to funder identifiers in our metadata, um, which, is, which is a very exciting development. So you can use ROAR to identify your fund, funders and make those connections that way. Um, we have a number of funder um, members that, and that's growing every day. Um, we have, well, maybe not every day, but <laughs> fairly quickly. We have uh, the um, 114,000 grants registered. Um, within those grant records that we register, we have, um, we, <laughs> yeah, a little bit of an allergy situation going on. Um, we have these grant re metadata records um, that 
they allow funders to register a DOI using a defined metadata scheme, schema that ensures persistency and consistency across funders. Um, we found when working with funders that many funders collect similar metadata, but there wasn't really an overall global way to make these records machine readable. So we have made, we have a metadata schema for grants and we are currently actively developing that. Um, those That metadata schema includes full funding information like funder name, funder identifiers, um, the amount of funding, currency, the type of funding. Um, there are ways to connect these funding rec records to journal articles and other research outputs. Um, we are also collecting project information like investigators, descriptions, dates, and funding information and um, we make active use of persistent identifiers wherever possible. Um, we're also looking to uh, very actively ex expand the grant metadata we collect to better support language metadata, a wider range of dates, and we're always expanding funding types among other things. Um, so we do have a lot of Crossref funder members who are registering grant records with us. Um, as they become more widely used, we anticipate we'll see an increase in relationships identifying who funded what research outputs as more metadata is supplied. And so for like my my answer to the magic wand um, collection, I feel like uh, the ma magic wand question, I feel like whenever we have new waves of membership, we learn more about, about what's going on in the funder world and what metadata they're collecting. There's all these like, differences and there aren't really these firm taxonomies or vocabularies describing things. So I feel like the more participation we have and the more metadata we have, the more we can move this along, along with uh, making this easier for everyone to provide this metadata. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, we have several people from Crossref uh, here. We've got some dis great discussion going on in the chat, which hopefully will spill over into the uh, Q&A session at the end. Um, I did also want to call particular attention to a blog post that Crossref put out just yesterday. I did put the link to that in the chat, um, which goes into a bit more detail about uh, specifically Crossref's work um, to transition from funder registry IDs to ROAR IDs. Um, so please take a look at that. Uh, and then next up, we have, sorry, I think it's, is it Kristen's turn? Let me just make sure. Uh, yes, it is Kristen. <laughs> I want to make absolutely sure before I turn it over to you. Uh, so our last presenter is Kristen. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, all right, so great presentations from everybody so far. And um, it's fun to go last because you can, you know, point to all of the hard work that everyone else has done to line up why um, funder metadata is so important. My name is Kristen Rattan. Um, I started Strategies for Open Science to help funders, but uh, institutions and others implement open science programs and from policy to practice. I also started i which is incentivizing collaborative open research, and we're conducting meta-analyses on open science and open scholarship to understand what best practices we should be doing, the impact of policy changes and things like that. And I'm wearing my ASAP hat today, which is one of my uh, funder clients, uh, Aligning Science Across Parkinson's, and I'll talk a little more about who they are, but working with them to implement a full panel of open science policies and then put those into practice has been an exercise in really understanding all of the pieces and moving parts that are needed to make this work fluidly. So way back when the world was young, um, and uh, this picture dates me, um, we, the only way that we could keep track of what was out there in the world um, in the published record was literally through card catalogs. And these card catalogs contained, I love this image, uh, it, all of the metadata needed about, say, a book. And I remember, because I'm that old, browsing through them and finding things. And all of that, all the metadata there was really painstakingly gathered and presented. And it's what connected everything to everything. Otherwise, literally, we had nowhere else to search. So what this led to as people started to move these kinds of complex metadata schemas online are 
really intense in abstracting and indexing databases, long lists of advanced search fields that you could look at. Metadata was in our faces at every single moment as we did conducted our research and did this kind of this kind of work. And a lot of this was gathered and in, in uh, input by human beings. Um, so then Google came along and pretty much the complexity disappeared. Nobody had to think about what metadata was out there and what had been assigned to records and people and institutions and things like that, because Google could pull up anything magically for us. So I think that that now we're trying to sort of claw our way back to understanding the importance of this and understanding the schemas and what's needed and and inventing a much more structured standards-based way of utilizing that. And I think that's fantastic. Um, so looking at uh, aligning science across Parkinson's, um, this is a funding initiative, a relatively new initiative launched in 2019 and um, uh, putting a significant amount, about a billion dollars towards Parkinson's research. Uh, and the as it started back in 2019, um, the interest from those who began it was to make it a fully open science implementation. So this was the, at least the first funder that I'd worked with that was 100% committed to open science from the get-go. And to do it because, not just because open is great, but in support of greater collaboration. And so the uh, Aligning Science Across Parkinson's built a collaborative research network um, that has a set of policies and practices to share information openly in order to improve collaboration across the network and outside of it. So I hope to write these policies and they're probably as open forward as a policy structure as I've seen from a funder, um, in addition to a mandatory preprint and mandatory open access with certain like things like CC BY licensing, um, all data code and other outputs like protocols and um, tangible resources and things have to be made available have to be linked to from that mandatory preprint and have to have a, per, a persistent identifier associated with them. Um, and then in addition, number four, which is appropriate app, uh, attribution has to be included. And this is where the funder metadata comes in right from the beginning. This is up there in the list with all these other policies at the same level. You must put the attribution in as a researcher if you wanna receive the funds. So that starts to get the metadata ball rolling early in the process when your funder is saying, here's exactly how you're going to attribute us as a funder. And then what we also did was we are logging every one of those outputs on the back end. By we, I mean ASAP. Um, and so every time somebody actually produces a protocol and puts it on protocols.io, that is getting logged on the back end in a research output management system that ASAP runs and all of the appropriate metadata is getting logged with it. So what has that led to all of the sharing? Um, this is already six months old, but you can see there are a lot of articles and protocols and everything else. And this is just over the very first, this wasn't even quite three years of funding. So this first cohort of grantees produced a lot of outputs. And all of these outputs uh, are available in a catalog that's public facing. So you can actually go and search that catalog and you can see all these outputs. Um, this is almost like reinventing the abstracting and indexing service now, but for all the outputs. And I think this is gonna be increasingly important because we have a lot of policies now about sharing, but we don't really have good places where we can find all that information that's shared um, and search across all of the repositories and all the different areas where that information is. And it is only through the funder metadata being associated with all of the other metadata that each of these outputs gets that we could have this kind of thing happening and that this example of a single catalog from a single funder can become the norm across all of the outputs that are gathered. But there's a more compelling reason to consider this. And this is ASAP as a funder is interested in how credit is assigned, is interested in what the incentives are to conducting research and sharing research and thinking about the maybe a shift away from the traditional credit given by say a journal impact factor and author ordering in an article, which all feels very print-based and a little old fashioned now, to how does credit get assigned at a more granular level when all of the outputs are open and not just an article being published, but data sets and code and other things, how can you start to begin to offer credit at the level of those outputs? Um, and as a funder, 
where the funder assigns credit matters, right? Researchers care deeply about what their funders are counting, what they're looking at, and what matters to them. So if you're creating a funding application and you're pointing not just to your high impact articles, you can actually say, I've also contributed all of these data sets, these protocols, my protocols have been cited many times, all of the outputs that you're producing. So this shift in credit away from the article and towards this much broader constellation of sharing is a fundamental change in the incentive structures. And ASAP is at the forefront of it. And it's exciting to be able to, uh, to work with them on this. So what does this look like in, in, in practical real life? So this is a Zenodo record of an ASAP um, team it's, uh, code base. This is a piece of code. They've created a Zenodo record so that it gets a DOI. It has all the appropriate information about authors and affiliations, and you can see the funding metadata um, as well. And what this allows us to know is that this guy, David, is the first contributor on this piece of code, but he's the third author when the paper comes out. Um, and because we actually know, A, he shared the code, he's funded by ASAP, and he was the first contributor, and then the code, of course, can start to collect things like views and downloads and other pieces of uh, post sharing metadata. Um, we're able to start to under, understand the impact of David's work well beyond this third authorship uh, affiliate, you know, um, uh, um, uh, authorship, you know, piece of metadata. So we're able to understand what David really contributed in the work here. And this can then be used to evaluate his work as he comes up for a grant renewal or something along those lines. So I just leave with the magic wand question really is, is it all starts with ORCIDs. If everybody just had ORCIDs right from the beginning, all of the rest of this could just be assigned. The magic of APIs and things like that would work. But the, the, real, the real issue is, is how do we use things like this to shape how science is produced and credited? And if we wanna change it, we have to be able to know it happened, right? We need to be able to incentivize the behaviors that we want to reward and we need to be able to track the things that we want to count. And to do that, we need all the metadata in place. So ASAP is very much a begin as you mean to go on type of funder, gathering this information right at the very beginning. The minute somebody comes on board, they have an ORCID, they have to, to even apply for a grant, and it all just flows from there. So it feels onerous, I'm sure, to other funders to, to think about it this way, but it begins with the funding stage. That is the earliest point of contact that that researcher has with any of these entities and organizations. So um, I, I hope we're all on board with collecting all of this and, 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 and ensuring that researchers never have to manually enter any more of this information themselves. And I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you so much, Kristen, that's fascinating. Um, maybe just quickly to put you on the spot, is, is that your is that your magic wand <laughs> that everybody would collect it at the stage of funding? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, everyone else had really good magic wands, so I can't repeat what they said. But um, I think, yeah, it, it. You know, what is the earliest point at which we have any control? Where do we have that moment of attention? And funding is the first moment of attention. Publishing is a second one, but funding comes first. So if all of that information mm -hmm. starts to be collected and then moves through all of these third-party systems. That way, I think it would uh, it would make a big difference. Great, understood. Um, so yes, um, I wanted to start by um, asking some of the panelists maybe to uh, talk to each other. We have lots and lots of stuff um, going on in the chat, but I did just uh, want to give the panelists themselves an opportunity to respond to one another's presentations was there anything that you saw for instance you know we've talked a little bit about so caroline is here representing all publishers everywhere <laughs> um, and you know uh kristen is here representing funders and so we we've you know had some discussion about well where is the best place for this for this metadata to get collected sarah had mentioned it would be great if the funders provided an api um we've been talking about um, you know, where could we get that from a system such as Proposal Central, you know, from an API there? Anyway, so um, just to give you all a chance to talk to one another about anything you noticed in one another's presentations. Yes, Howard. Yeah, so just wanted to ask Kristen what she thought about this. So 
Um, I've often agreed with you that the, the two gateway points for people to start assigning persistent identifiers were when, when they went for funding and when they went for publication. But actually, because you mentioned ORCID, it makes me realize that actually it's when they become an actual researcher, shouldn't they go get an ORCID then and associate it immediately with their, with their organization? Yes. Yes, they should. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I actually think it's the job of an institution to make sure that everybody has ORCIDs right from the get-go. I think that would be amazing. Um, but because institutions don't always do that, and there are a lot of them, I think funders can. Um, just to, to get back to the question, though, of um, you know the thing about it from a funder perspective, I work with a lot of funders, and I, I sit in a lot of funder groups, and uh, funders are, are, are need, I think, a little bit more organization. They need more centralized services. Um, they need, so I just saw in the chat, is there a user community for funders working with Crossref? Um, I, it would be amazing from a funder perspective if there were a user community across the PID organizations. Yeah. Um, and, and if there were some centralized services that people could depend on that would make it easy for Proposal Central or Flux or whatever services, their systems they're using to make the deposits on behalf of the funders. Um, right now, the landscape from, a, I think, from a funder perspective, and there are a lot of you in the chat, so please weigh in, it feels kind of fractured and confusing. And that uh, if the funders didn't have to learn the difference between every single PID and all of the different requirements, it might be really helpful. So, you know, things that they can do, that they can get their representatives like Proposal Central to do on their behalf, I think would be helpful. There is a funder, yeah, there's a funder group for ORCID. There's, there, there are many of them. So I think centralizing that because to, uh, from a funder's perspective, a PID is a PID, right? Sort yourselves out. That's fascinating. And I will turn to other questions, but I will mention that actually Altum, I think we have some representatives from Altum here, um, is organizing a webinar for uh, about PIDs uh, that should be coming up this spring. So that might be a first step. And they have done a great job of convening conversations about this because as a system, Proposal Central um, has been very good about, about using PIDs. I know. Um, Alexander, you've got your hand up. Um, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I'm Alexander Schwarzman from uh, Optica Publishing Group, uh, formerly OSA, and I have two questions for Patricia Feeney. Um, uh, as uh, everybody knows, uh, publishers over the years um, make a, made a great investment into using Open Funder Registry and integrating it into the publishing workflows. Um, now, the two questions I have are one uh, conceptual and one practical. Conceptual one is what problem is being solved by uh, changing uh, Open Funder Registry for ROR IDs. It will create a significant investment and disruption in publishers' uh, workflows. Um, so why fix what isn't broken? And the practical question is, how much longer will Crossref uh, support um, Open Funder Registry uh, IDs before it's turned off and it's ROR IDs? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, the second question, I, I don't think we have a timeline for retiring the open funder registry because we're, we're just kicking this off and we really have to work with our members because we know it, it can be very disruptive and we have to make sure we're not uh, making it more challenging for them to provide this funding information um, my understanding we're moving we're folding the fund open funder registry into the rural registry because they are to a certain extent they're redundant um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to maintain these two separate registries and ROAR is being very ac actively ma maintained. Um, it's an open identifier. Um, the funder registry is an open identifier. Um, we, it takes a lot of work to curate a registry like this. Um, and I think 
Roar, Roar is great because it's got the backing of several organizations behind it, as opposed to the funder registry, which is a, a, a cross rough registry that takes data uh, that has been very generously donated by Elsevier. Um, so I think Roar has a has a very um, open and uh, active curation process. Um, so I think there are a lot of benefits to us moving to the Roar Registry, but we are aware that it's a, it will be a burden. So hopefully mm -hmm. you'll find moving forward. I, I think like I I think we're talking years, not months um, before we retire the registry. Yeah. So hopefully it'll it'll be something you can work into your workflow when you're doing work. I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in, anyone from the Roar side. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just weigh in in a second uh, as the person who's been leading a lot of the data transition from uh, the funder registry to Roar. So as Patricia mentioned, uh, Roar is very actively curated. Um, we're trending towards receiving something like over a thousand requests a month from various research organizations and funders around the world. By contrast, um, the funder registry probably maybe receives a tenth of that number in terms of its active maintenance. Those then have to go through a somewhat arcane process on the Elsevier side to be ingested back into the funder registry and made available. So because the community has kind of uh, really rallied behind Roar and created, uh, and we've supported them by creating a process that allows us to very quickly um, and efficiently update the records um, in ROAR relative to some of the funder registry kind of practices, as well as provide a more kind of complete and robust metadata schema, especially around things like language tagging and you know additional fields and representations of hierarchy that aren't available in the funder registry, that it just makes sense to essentially, as Patricia said, remove that redundancy, rally the energy that exists in the community behind ROAR towards creating the best possible form of a persistent identifier that captures both uh, you know, research organizations, those producing research, and those funding research. So, I, I did actually also wonder, Caroline, whether you'd be willing to speak to that as well, because you, um, we've been doing some user interviews with people who are already you know, incorporating the Open Funder Registry into their workflows. And Caroline in particular uh, and her colleagues spoke to us about about that because they are faced with that exact same um, task of transitioning. Caroline, do you have thoughts about this work? Uh, yeah, so um, one of the key things for us is that we work with a lot of um, other organizations in terms of how we collect these IDs and then how we can incorporate them into our papers. So we're somewhat reliant on other organizations and systems updating their workflows as well in order to support us how to do this. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's going to be a big task. It's going to be quite difficult, but it's important as well. Yeah, I'll add that there's one other thing that kind of came up in the context of the presentations is that Roar, um, as part of our service offerings, has always provided services for matching and reconciling, uh, reconciling free text affiliation strings to Roar ID specifically. Mm -hmm. um, this ex exists to a limited extent um, on the basis of name matching and cross up metadata, but uh, the funder registry and the funder matching that exists in Crossref doesn't actually allow for parsing of things like funders from longer text strings assertions. So at Crossref, what we're doing is actually now starting to build out these tools that will allow as many highlighted extraction of funders and identifiers from funding statements and kind of related longer free text, um, free text forms of assertion, and then be able to extract essentially raw IDs as funding references from those things. So uh, the ability to essentially extend some of the work that we've already done in, in processing free text into varieties into the funding context is another way that we're reducing that redundancy of you know ma matching the uh, the kind of <clears throat> existing existing funder metadata to uh, varieties. But think about the respective conversions. If a publisher wants to use business intelligence, for example, then. I think switching to the new way of identifying funders would require a publisher to retrospectively uh, reassign all the uh, funder IDs to ROR IDs in the backlog, in the back content. That's a big task. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this is actually already possible via our API because um, all funder IDs are exposed in their equivalencies. So there's the, it's essentially just a query for the funder ID and you can get back the corresponding where ID value for this. So there is a backlog and we understand that, that difficulty, but we are doing absolutely everything possible to make it, you know, as simple as just send a query for the funder ID, get the corresponding where ID back. Yeah. Yes, Shen Yang. Um, I should mention too um, uh, that we are going after this to uh, an informal drop-in hangout session. So uh, we are going to end the session um, right on time, but I do think we have time for one more question. Okay. <laughs> I got in the chat. I hope uh, uh, you know, Maria can touch on that. So um, I you know, help a lot of researchers and PIs on writing a DMSV and heavily involved in DMP tool. So we are moving toward machine actionable DMSV using the DMP tool. So having this raw information there, funder can actually um, keep track of how this DMSP is rolling out in terms of tracking their you know, research output and connecting all the uh, funding mechanisms. So I'm really curious about how integration is working along, you know, integrating ROI or funding metadata into DMP tool, because they do have a research output they can put in and they they ask for the funder but not necessarily linked to roar they did connect to read three data for repositories but how how are they integrating this role for funders or you know affiliation stuff into dmp2 to make the dmsp machine actionable thank you yeah so uh real quick i added some notes in the chat about it and i want to make sure that maybe we can squeeze in another question but it is happening uh in the next generation dmp infrastructure and i think for all of the nitty-gritty details i would just suggest reaching out to the very friendly team for a walkthrough of how it's being implemented but i know that it is already happening uh slash in progress on many fronts with the next generation dmp uh, networked infrastructure. So thanks for raising that. Thank you. I will reach out to Maria. Okay. Um, with that, I am going to um, wrap up the session. Um, I do see a question in the chat about, chat about where will the slides be published. Um, those will be on the ROAR website and will also be emailed to all registrants. And um, as two people have suggested in the chat, I think it, there is such a um, a great wealth of questions and answers and ideas in the chat that I will summarize those and um, send them out as a notes document um, afterward. Um, so uh, thank you all so much for a really terrific session. Um, this is clearly a topic that many people are really interested in and invested in, and um, we hope to facilitate more discussions going forward. And meanwhile, if you'd like to get more involved with Roar specifically, um, you can join us in any of these many channels, even if it's just signing up for our newsletter um, or uh, requesting changes to your own records. We had a couple of questions about, um, you know, how do I correct the information in my Roar record? That is a very simple process. Uh, look yourself up on Roar.search um, and then click the link at the bottom if you would like to make a change for um, a change request. Um, that's all. Thank you all for joining. Have a great day. Wow. Thanks, everyone.